We'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Leslie Braxick and I'm a member of the steering committee. I just want to welcome everyone here today and just uh, thank you for coming on this um, to hear uh, about a very, very important topic, um, hate and polarization in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, uh, in light of the size of the group, we're not going to use the QR code for question and answer. Just raise your hand, the old fashioned method. And um, we will uh, just take questions that way. Um, and I'll, um, at this point, really just to get us started, hand it over to the moderator, Michael Duffin. He's the senior advisor for the Bureau of Counterterrorism in the US Department of State. And um, Michael will introduce, um, will moderate the session and then also make sure the other panelists are introduced. So thank you for being here. And Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone can hear me. Um, Hate knows no borders, uh, and this discussion, it's going to focus on uh, an important region in the world that's often overlooked uh, in terms of violent white supremacy or what we at the U.S. Department of State call racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism, or RUNV. Um, that is uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, before we go to our panelists, uh, we're going to have some opening remarks by uh, Mr. Ian Moss, who is the Deputy Coordinator for Counterterrorism uh, at the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Counterterrorism. Uh, Ian, please. Um, Mike is uh, our resident expert, and much of the good work that we're doing at the State Department uh, related to RIMV uh, wouldn't be possible without him. Uh, he is uh, just an extraordinarily valuable member of our team. Uh, but I just wanted to thank everyone. Um, I'm really impressed by the dedication and, and passion uh, of the, all the speakers at this summit um, and, and everything that they've demonstrated to, towards combating hate. Uh, this includes, of course, the speakers for this panel, which was inspired by uh, the work that the department, uh, the State Department, is doing to counter uh, the transnational dimensions of racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism. Uh, and uh, an effort that has been supercharged since the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration. In the wake of the attack on Muslim worshipers at two mosques uh, in Christchurch, New Zealand in March 2019, investigators found a trail of breadcrumbs uh, the perpetrator left uh, across Central and Eastern Europe while meeting other white supremacists and visiting sites of religious and ethnic strife uh, in the year 2018. Although the perpetrator of the Christchurch attack, Britton Terrence, uh, travels to this region, likely did not uh, yield anything of value uh, in terms of uh, his tactical ability, he certainly found inspiration and support uh, from among uh, a, a number of individuals uh, who shared his twisted ideology. In Hanau, Germany, uh, in February 2020, a 43-year-old white supremacist who obtained weapons training at a commercial facility in Slovakia opened fire on two shisha bars in a racially motivated attack, killing nine people before killing his mother and himself. These are just two examples of the transnational nature, origins, and connections that attend the Rimvi threat. It is critical that we learn more about these transnational connections of Rimvi groups uh, and, and individuals uh, whether they are operational or just simply aspirational. As our panelists will discuss, RIMBY actors across Europe uh, and around the world have traveled to several countries in Central and Eastern Europe to participate in neo-Nazi concerts, white, whites-only mixed martial arts tournaments, paramilitary training, marches, uh, and rallies. Frequently, RIMBY actors assault their victims with, with knives, clubs, and fists rather than bombs or guns, uh, which attracts less public attention uh, and makes it harder to obtain reliable data to quantify this threat. This is why engaging government and civil society stakeholders in Central and Eastern Europe is a critical part of the State Department's efforts to counter RIMV globally. I would like to touch on some of these efforts briefly. In May, in partnership with the Government of Germany, the Department of State, uh, and the Department of Justice launched in Berlin the Counterterrorism Law Enforcement Forum. Over the course of two days, law enforcement officials, criminal justice practitioners, and diplomats from more than 30 countries joined experts from several multilateral and civil society organizations to discuss ways to increase focus, awareness, and information exchanges to counter RIMVI actors and groups. This important forum will be held annually. 
Last October, working with the Strong, Sh Strong Cities Network, the State Department sponsored a workshop in Bratislava, Slovakia for local government officials and practitioners. This was the first ever RIMV-focused workshop Strong Cities Network and the State Department organized in the region, but it won't be the last. In November, uh, Strong Cities will host, this coming November, Strong Cities will host a follow-up workshop in Bratislava. This time, including local and national government officials and practitioners from Austria, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, the Republic of Georgia, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and of course, Slovakia. In addition to the workshop, we are supporting small grants and a virtual working group that is building a regional cohort of practitioners who are better equipped to identify the warning signs of radicalization and recruitment to violence. We also partnered with Norway to sponsor the Global Counterterrorism Forum RINV Toolkit, which we'll discuss during a panel discussion in the next session. Further, we have supported the Invent to Prevent Countering Hate and Intolerance Program in Slovakia and other countries outside of the region. Similar to the DHS-funded Invent to Prevent and the peer-to-peer -peer Facebook Global Digital Challenge programs, uh, programs, this initiative empowers students to develop online and offline campaigns to push back against hate and intolerance on their educational campuses and in their communities. We plan to expand Invent to Prevent to additional countries next year. We have also sent former white supremacists who have renounced hate on speaker programs to countries such as Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Norway, and Slovakia to engage journalists, policymakers, practitioners, and youth about the threat of white supremacist violence. In 2016, we sent former neo-Nazi skinhead Kristen Picciolini to Slovakia. Picciolini's visit helped serve as a wake-up call to the dangers of Renvi, particularly as some of these actors are seeking to enter government. Picciolini was also one of the attendees of the United We Stand Summit President Biden convened at the White House just last week uh, in response to numerous incidents of hate-fueled vi hate violence in the United States, including the racially motivated supermarket attack in Buffalo in May. I cannot overstate the importance of President Biden and other elected leaders dousing the flames of hatred, bigotry, and xenophobia, not fanning them. Before I conclude, I want to stress the need for greater collaboration between experts from North America and Western Europe uh, and engagement with counterparts in Central and Eastern Europe. RIMBY actors have been traveling to this region for years, including two white supremacists from the United States who committed anti-Semitic attacks, excuse me, acts at the site of the Auschwitz uh, concentration camp in Poland just last month. This panel featuring prominent experts from Poland and the United States is an example of, of the collaboration and, corroborate, and cooperation that is necessary if we were to stop hate in its tracks. Uh, I thank everybody again, uh, and, and Mike, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, our first speaker, we're going to have a, we're going to have each of the panelists uh, give opening statements of two to three minutes, uh, and then we're going to go into a discussion. And uh, instead of submitting questions via uh, the app or uh, the QR code, we're just going to have you, since it's an, it's an intimate audience, um, just raise your hand uh, um, after the opening statements, and we'll we'll have a, a discuss an interactive discussion. Um, our first speaker to my left uh, is Dr. Rafal Pankowski, a sociologist and professor uh, who's based out of Warsaw. And can we please go to the first slide, uh, the next slide? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be part of this panel at, at the Global Summit. And I think, uh, well, this panel is helping the, the summit live up to its name. I think this discussion is making the, the summit a little more global. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the context is, is, is very special uh, when discussing about uh, the issue of uh, extremism in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, it is the context of the war in Ukraine. And I would like to state by, I would like to uh, start uh, by um, paying tribute to, to the people of Ukraine and all the innocent victims uh, of the war. I think the war in Ukraine really shows us uh, what the politics of hate and authoritarianism leads to. Ultimately, it, it leads to mass violence and mass suffering. Um, but we must not forget also about the other uh, big part of the context in, in the region, which is what we may uh, refer to as democratic backsliding or a crisis of democratic culture and democratic values, which is not going away. Um, and I think when we when we talk about the war and uh, and we talk about the democratic backsliding, I think when talking about either of them, we must 
we must not forget about the other. And uh, that's, that's one thing I, I, I wanted to, uh, um, to state here. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is the Independence Day March in Warsaw. Because I think it is a good example of the much bigger phenomenon uh, which, uh, uh, which has been called the internationalization of extremism or the paradoxical internationalization of uh, extreme nationalism. The, the event in Warsaw is also an example of uh, what happens when hate goes unchecked. Uh, it started as a small event uh, back in 2009 with just about 500 participants, mostly racist skinheads, who, who marched through the center of Warsaw. Uh, in 2010, I remember witnessing the gathering which uh, had about 3,000 participants. And I was thinking that's, uh, that's a big number. And of course, I was very naive uh, because the event became bigger and bigger every year. And in the last years, it, it has effectively become the biggest extreme right gathering anywhere in Europe and I think beyond Europe too, um, uh, which is no longer just a Polish event, but it draws uh, an international crowd, uh, uh, just about every extreme right and racist group from Europe, and in many cases from outside Europe, they go to Warsaw on, on, uh, on the 11th of November, uh, the main Polish holiday, uh, which doesn't really make me proud, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, and I think this is the kind of event that we can symbolically uh, call a super spreader event. And I think we can also explain it to the American audience as uh, Charlottesville on steroids, because uh, in the last years uh, it, it, it draws, well, more than 100,000 participants. Not all of them are right-wing extremists, but it is very clear who the organizers are. These are far-right groups uh, uh, whose very names, the All Polish Youth and the National Radical Camp, go back uh, to anti-Semitic violent groups uh, that existed in Poland in the 1930s. Um, and one more thing I would like to, uh, to, uh, to mention in the context of the Independence Day in, uh, in, in the Independence Day March in, in, in Warsaw is the issue of um, reaction uh, from the mainstream society. I already mentioned that a lot of the participants of the march are not right-wing extremists, but they are drawn to it. Um, the distinction between the mainstream politics and uh, the, the, the radical extremist uh, right uh, in, uh, in Poland uh, has, has been blurred in, in, in recent years. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big mistake uh, for the Polish Ministry of Culture and National Heritage to actually uh, subsidize financially um, one of the organizations that is behind the march, the Independence uh, March Association. I think it is a big mistake and it is discussed a lot in, 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 in Polish public opinion. But we must not forget that this is not the only uh, uh, nationalist march uh, with international participation that takes place in Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. There are other marches. There is one in Budapest. Uh, there is one in Bulgaria. Uh, there are other, other events uh, which are not as big as, as, the, as, the, as the one in Warsaw, um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they are similar in the sense uh, that these are uh, events organized by extremists with the participation of um, um, extremists from, uh, from, from other countries uh, across and beyond the region of, uh, of Central and Eastern Europe. And I think that is probably more than enough yes. for starters, and I, I'm looking forward and to the discussion. Thank you, uh, Rafael. And our next speaker, Marilyn Mayo of the Anti-Defamation League, will touch a little bit on that as well. Uh, next slide, please. And Marilyn, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here, and I'm giving a little bit of the American perspective on this issue. Um, so. Um, I'm a senior research fellow at ADL, at the Anti-Defamation League, and uh, at the ADL we're really concerned about international extremism and particularly how extremists in the U.S. are networking you know, with their counterparts abroad um, and, and, and the tactics and strategies 
that they're sharing and how they influence each other's ideology. And we've seen white supremacists from the U.S., for example, go to the independence um, march in Poland, particularly in 2019, before COVID, right? So it's like we haven't seen it uh, in more recent years because of COVID. But in 2019, you had two major white supremacist groups that went from the United States that went to uh, the march. And that's uh, Patriot Front, which is a group that's one of the most active white supremacist groups in the U.S. all across the country. And the other group was uh, called Identity of Ropa, uh, which is now defunct. But um, the person who was in charge of that group, Patrick Casey, is still active in the white supremacist movement. Um, And we know that white supremacists look at countries in Eastern Europe, like like Poland, like Hungary, other countries, Serbia, um, as models um, for uh, white Christian, what they call white Christian values, and, um, and, and also admire them for rejecting immigrants from the Middle East and Africa, particularly during the Syrian refugee crisis. And um, I'm going to, I want to pivot a little bit and touch on something else that's of concern to us, which is um, that we have groups, like uh, more um, conservative groups in the U.S. that are turning to countries like um, uh, mo- mostly more, more like Hungary, but, but uh, I think uh, Poland can fall into that category too. Um, in, but for the most part, embracing um, the nationalism that we're seeing coming out of those countries, the authoritarianism. And for example, um, you know, and, and I think really what's of tremendous concern is that um, they're doing it for some of the same reasons that the white supremacists are doing it, right? Because they see those countries as models of preserving white Christian values, of being um, uh, against multiculturalism, against diversity. Uh, And so, um, you know, for example, the American Conservative Union, uh, which is one of the most established conservative organizations in the U.S., um, they held their conservative political action conference in Budapest and featured Viktor Orban and other leaders from uh, far-right parties in in Europe. And uh, they also invited Viktor Orban to come speak in August in Dallas um, for their conference. And he was the keynote speaker and talked about, um, you know, uh, woke societies and, um, you know, promoting, like, Christian um, uh, conservatism and... Um, preserving Western civilization, which is often a euphemism for, again, um, that, that we see white nationalists use to preserve um, white Christian culture. So this is, again, of tremendous concern. And I'm going to stop there because I want us to get to questions. But these are the, the two areas that are of most concern right now. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Uh, next uh, to her left is Dr. Kasper Rekovic uh, from the University of Oslo's uh, Center on Research. Center on Research um, on Extremism. Excuse me, yes. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to the organizers for having me. Thank you all for, for coming and then really happy to be on this panel. I'll explain what this slide is about in a second. But uh, Marlene alluded to the fact that quite a few people in the West see the part of this, this part of Europe, and I'm also Polish, by the way, but it's the only time I use the word Poland on this panel. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, there are way better experts here than me on this. Um, they see um, our region as a kind of a Shangri-La, you know, the place where you can be yourself. Whether that's the case, I'm not sure. And I want to just put two ironies on the table here. The first irony is that, you know, um, when I spoke to a far-right individual from Ukraine, I mostly look at Ukraine, he told me that he's kind of confused because in the past um, he had to check what the American far-right people are wearing, listening to, and how they're behaving. Now it's the other way around. They come to me and they ask me what to do. And I'm not sure that I can be a role model. You know, we Central Eastern Europeans, were a bit shy. And especially if a Westerner comes to us and wants to us, us to be the role mo- uh, you know, as a role model, well, that's a unique situation for us, you know. So this is the point, the first irony that I want to put on the table. I'm not sure that the far right, far rights of the region are 100% ready for being the role models. They are asked to step up, but I'm not sure that's the case. And I'll give you an example. On the left in the slide that you see, it's actually a Telegram channel snapshot of the Azov movement. You might have heard of Azov in the United States because apparently at some point they were a candidate 
to be added on the foreign terrorist organizations list. No of course, you cannot comment on that, Michael. <laughs> but you know, uh, whether that merits this, that's a completely different matter. So Azov says, come and join us in the war in Ukraine. I mean, Rus Ru 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 Russia-Ukraine war. And they put out this call, and they are allegedly this horribly uh, dangerous organization, and they recruit that many people in the photo that you see. I've interviewed four of them, so I can tell you that I have a pretty good grasp of this issue. Now, apparently 20,000 people expressed a want, a need to go and fight for Ukraine, not just far-right individuals. 20,000. They recruited that many. Have they stepped up? Are they ready? Are they a player? That's probably up to us to discuss on, on, on this panel as well. So, you know, on one hand, you will see those images that we've seen from Warsaw and from other places, from Budapest, because I believe the other photo Marilyn was from Budapest. And on the other hand, you have this. Then the second irony that I just like wanted to point out to you is that quite a lot of the friends of this organization that tried to recruit fighters for Ukraine in this war, far right, you know, foreign fighters, who, you know, really sounds horrific. Quite a lot of their friends in the West are actually pro-Russian. And they cannot fathom fighting against Vladimir Putin, who is a traditionalist, anti-LGBT, anti-liberal anti leader, and an orthodox person who so has this whole spirituality that we allegedly don't have, neither of us does, you know, it's kind of hard to fight him. You know, he is the guy, we want to be like him, we want to be like Russia, then why would I join and fight against him? And that leads me to the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, that quite a lot of this that we're discussing here, and Rafał alluded to that, is connected to Russia. This summit is called Eradicate Hate. And certainly, the country, Russia, is spawning quite a lot of hate at the, very, at the very moment. So let's not forget the elephant in the room, and it's quite a big elephant, and I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Casper. Uh, next slide, please. And um, our, the last uh, panelist that, that's present here, and we have video remarks for a panelist who wasn't able to make it here, uh, Katarzyna uh, Vlodkowska, who is a journalist from the, the Polish uh, newspaper Gazeta, and she's going to... Uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh. Um, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Katarzyna Wodkowska. I'm a reporter for Gazeta Wyborcza. It's a Poland's leading liberal newspaper. I've been in professional for 17 years. Uh, my main focus is social and criminal injustice. And I was invited here, which is really a huge privilege for me. Thank you, Michael. Because of my cover story from January 2020, um, it was an um, investigative report about the assassin of the president of Gdańsk, Major Paweł, uh, Mr. Paweł Adamowicz, who was stabbed in a heart on a scene during the largest charity event in Poland. Um, the assassin, the killer, 27-year-old man, was released from prison a month before. And the reason why he chosen Mr. Adamowicz uh, to kill was as happened here in has happened here in Pittsburgh um, the hate speech hate speech the, the year before in 2018 we had in Poland local elections and Gdańsk is the one of the most important cities on the politician map I will explain you now why um, first uh, civic platform the lar largest um, centrist opposition party in Poland was found in the city in Gdańsk. Uh, Donald Tusk, the leader of the group, uh, is from Gdańsk. Um, third, the law and justice who um, ruled the country um, since 2015 um, never won in a city. And, and last, Paweł Adamowicz was the perfect target. Uh, with other few mayors, he invited to our city Mm, refugees. After years of being traditionalist and conservative, he became quite liberal and progressive. He decided to support the LGBT community and was the first Polish politician who proposed the legalization on one of the biggest national groups in Poland. Those groups are, um, are highly supported by the Polish government uh, as uh, Rafan pointed out they received lots of money. If someone will bring accusation against them to the prosecutor office, prosecutor office often chooses to not react. Even when one of these groups published the public death certificates of Paweł Adamowicz and other whom, uh, few mayors who um, welcomed refugees. And um, 
in public television to build the impression that Pavo Adamovic is a pure evil made during the 2018 um, almost 1,800 materials about him and um, it averaged f five times a day and they suggested he was serving German um, interest, not Polish. He, they accused him, accusing him from promoting Nazism, uh, had been called a thief, uh, betrayer, uh, mafioso, and many times didn't even ask him about any comment. Mm, and as we know from the perspective of psychology, perpetrators of such a crimes are many times people with uh, various types of disorders. And um, politician ideology, media message, um, chain of hate in social media, media can inspire them or direct even their aggression uh, towards a particular um, object. And the killer, uh, after he killed Mr. Adamovich, um, he announced that he did it to get revenge uh, on civic platform because in his opinion they put him unjustly uh, to the prison. Of course, um, uh, there was nothing unjustly in it. He was even uh, he was in a prison for a couple of robberies. He was uh, filmed by uh, by this um, act so action, so there was no doubt. But um, that was revenge. But the the thing is, Mr. Adamovich, uh, four year earlier, um, um, four year earlier, he decided to leave uh, civic platform. So what's the point why the killer chose, chose him? And as I proved in my report, um, in a prison, uh, the killer had access to public television, watched this and many times talk about Mr. Adamovich the way as he seen it um, in, a uh, in public television. And uh, to, to understand the whole situation, I will explain you just only one con uh, context. The killer didn't choose this charity even while he killed coincidentally. Um, the Great Orchestra of Christmas, um, I think we do not have any other event who received so much hate during last years. Um, the orchestra critics and of course public media hate this because um, they are leftist, a uh, tiny bit anarchist, definitely um, not on a side, on a government side, uh, LGBT friendly, so in their opinion, anti-Polish. And the same situation is with the judges system. Judges, judges are accused of being a, a, a group above the law, a caste above the law, even uh, some corrupt group that should be that should be replaced. So the killer behind the bars was watching uh, news about uh, bad guys and the necessity of the radical solutions. So he went out angry at the um, opposition party, its ex-member and judges system. And after Pavel Adamovich died, a couple of journalists announced that, that in their opinion, um, public television has moral responsibility for this tragedy. Of course, public television sued them. And uh, um, last year, um, court announced in a, in a verdict that we have a right to say that. Um, and the saddest uh, conclusion of this story is that barely anything changed and now we have even worse situation and the public media has another target but I hope there's going to be possible to talk about it too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our, our final panelist who was unable to uh, be here, uh, Rob Williams from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, did record uh, video remarks and so we would like to play them now. Please. It's my pleasure to join you today, albeit recording in a dimly lit hotel room due to an emergency. In the next few minutes, I'm going to tee up some discussion for the panel by addressing a key issue that faces the fight against anti-Semitism, particularly in some parts of Central and Eastern Europe, denial and distortion of the Holocaust. What do I mean by these terms? Well, Holocaust denial is somewhat easier to wrap our heads around. It's an attempt to convince people that the Holocaust and occasionally related atrocities never happened. Holocaust deniers really only have two goals to make anti-Semitism acceptable, and to provide legitimacy for fascism. This means that denial is anti-Semitism, full stop. It's a problem. 
but it is a considerably less common problem in our parts of the world today than Holocaust distortion. Holocaust distortion is an attempt to excuse, minimize, or otherwise misrepresent the Holocaust, both as something historical and as something that has relevance today. It's tricky because distortion does not deny the reality of the Holocaust necessarily, and it's also difficult to identify the motives behind it. Is someone distorting for cynical, hateful reasons or because they don't know the facts? Well, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Think of it this way. On a moral level, distortion is an insult to the memories of victims and survivors. And on a practical level, it can act as a gateway drug, if you will, to conspiracy theory, to outright Holocaust denial, and to more dangerous forms of anti-Semitism. Distortion takes on many forms. Sometimes it's an inappropriate comparison to the Holocaust, something we've become well familiar with over the course of the COVID pandemic. Sometimes it's an effort to twist the Holocaust in order to radicalize or sow confusion. In short, it can be innocent, it can be innocuous, and it can be intentional. And it can also come from governments. On this last point, consider, if you will, what we've seen coming from the Russian Federation for a number of years. Rhetoric that misuses the Holocaust in ways that justify Russian aggression. Something we've seen especially before and during the invasion of Ukraine. Sometimes it's unsophisticated, like signs appearing on bus stops in Moscow saying Sweden's run by Nazis. Other times it comes from the highest echelons of power, like when Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov said, quote, Jewish people, wise Jewish people, rather, say that the most ardent anti-Semites are Jews, end quote. But these things are not unique just to Russia, as our panelists will soon discuss. So I'm going to use my remaining time to address a particular form of distortion, something that I'll call rehabilitation. It's an umbrella term to describe attempts to heroize, whitewash, or otherwise restore the reputations of persons and occasionally organizations complicit in Holocaust-era crimes. This is an international phenomenon, one not unique just to former Axis powers. It can happen in countries that were occupied by the Axis, countries that were neutral during the war, and in countries that were part of the alliance, including the United States. It is a shared problem that demands a common and international solution. At times, the so-called rehabilitated benefit through official processes, like a high court overturning a long-past judicial sentence. I'll give you an example. In 1946, a Nazi collaborator named Leon Rupnik was captured, tried, and hanged for his crimes. In January 2020, the Slovenian Supreme Court overturned Rupnik's death sentence. Now, he's dead, but because the court overturned his death sentence on a technicality, it brings with it a risk that Rupnik could be seen by some as an absolved hero in certain segments of society. But courts aren't always necessary. Other times, parliaments have taken official action. We've seen this again and again in a number of Eastern European countries like Ukraine, Lithuania, Bulgaria, and others. There, many of the rehabilitated are being elevated because they were part of the anti-Soviet resistance. But some of these individuals also collaborated with the Nazis in crimes against Jews, Roma, ethnic Poles, and other groups. Persons like Roman Shukevich in Ukraine, for example. Other times, individuals have undergone cultural rehabilitation because they were well-known authors or artists. Some are protected by religious authorities. Others are erased from historical discussion entirely. Think of the Russian Liberation Army in this case. Others went on to fame after the war. To this list, we could include some of those Nazi scientists brought to the United States to work on our rocket program. There are even cases of rehabilitation outside particular national contexts. Think of the popularity of the writings of the Italian fascist ideologue Julius Evola among extreme right groups in North America, or the fact that you can buy the scribblings of the Belgian SS officer Leon de Grel in legitimate bookstores in parts of Eastern Europe. Well, what do we do about this? We could decide to do nothing, but then we risk signaling that some actions and ways of thinking are excusable, and our common agreement rejects this. While it's always possible to forgive an individual for her or his sins, we cannot forgive deeds and, in this case at least, the atrocities of the Holocaust violated our shared moral principles. 
So to achieve a better balance, we need history, a history that seeks a better understanding and relationship with the past in order to bring about a more peaceable present and future. And we cannot achieve this if we only see the Holocaust through a warped lens. Clarity will require that we ensure that legal and political rehabilitation come to an end, both in our country and abroad, that we engage with history in ways that reach non-specialists, and that we realize the, that the safety of a shared international future rests on a relationship with the past that sees it not as we hope it might have been, but rather as it actually was. I thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing the outcomes of this conference and this discussion. Great. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so uh, given that we have about 19 minutes remaining, um, I'm going to ask one question for all the panelists, if you could please. Uh, we could start with Katarzyna and move this way um, in a minute or less. I, I want to discuss uh, why does Central and Eastern Europe matter? And I say, why does it matter uh, in terms of hate and polarization? We're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the United States. And for some people, I'm sure we're all well-traveled uh, people in the audience, but for those who have never been to uh, Slovakia or Poland or Hungary or Ukraine, uh, why does what happens far away matter here uh, or in Canada or in Western Europe? Mm. Well, the situation, the story in Gdańsk is important, yes? Yes, yes. Um, you know, I'm thinking about this um, since yesterday because um, um, before I came here, I, I, I had totally different answers. And since I'm here, I realized that uh, we have some basic stuff to do again. Because like I thought uh, at the end of my speech, um, now we have now the public television have has a new um, target. It's Donald Tusk, Donald Tusk, the leader of uh, Civic Platform, uh, which he is. They accuse him almost uh, about everything. Um, called a betrayer, uh, enemy of people. Um, one of the materials of Donald Tusk given was accompanied with uh, photos of Stalin and Hitler. And after this material, one of the columnists wrote, it would be best for law and justice to shoot the, the Tusk three months before the elections. Of course, later he explained that was a metaphor, but it's difficult to, um, to think about it like that. Um, and I think the story shows us because I realized like we lost seven years. I mean, those seven years since law and justice ruled the country. Uh, civic platform is very big uh, group. They have huge public money and they can create lots of like networks, groups. They can support scientists. Um, I think they really lost those of seven years. Even in preparation, preparation from this conference, I called to the uh, spokesman of a civic platform and ask him, are you doing anything with this? Um, did you suit for at least once for hatred, uh, public television? And I couldn't have gotten more surprising uh, the answer because um, it seems they didn't. And when I asked why, he told me that um, they are afraid that it will seem that they are weak if they will start fighting. And um, so I think the lesson is like, for me, the lesson, I'm thinking what I should, what I should do, because I just realized that like, I know what, what is lesson for me. I will come back from this conference. I will um, write an article. I will publicly, publicly ask a civic platform, why are you not doing uh, nothing? And I will... Um, maybe propose some basic stuff that we can't ignore any act of hate speech. And the uh, basic stuff is to um, name it and react. And I was wondering, um, maybe we are in a, in a point, maybe not even in, only in Polish, that something bad is happening with us that we tiny got used to it. That something, that's, that such a things are happening. happening. So, 
Yeah, really quickly. Thank you, Michael, for that. I would say uh, we, all, we would probably all agree in the room that Western Europe is important to the United States. So do not think of us as Central Eastern Europe. Don't call us Eastern Europe, by the way. Do us, the, you know, favor, do us a favor. Uh, at least do Central Eastern Europe. Think of us as a soft underbelly of Western Europe. You know, you're talking EU member states. You're talking NATO countries. That's why it's important. Plus, quite a few of us live amongst you. You know, our problems are also your problems and vice versa, believe it or not. You know, there's quite a few poles around in this area as well. So it's kind of like, you know, to ask about the connection, it's, it's, it's obvious in this sense. No. So <clears throat> I think your slide says it all. The mainstreaming of hate uh, is an incredible uh, trend that we're seeing um, in the United States. And I think it's happening in, in Europe as well. Um, but... You know, I'll, I'll point to just a couple of examples of some things that we're seeing. Um, Tucker Carlson, who has probably one of the greatest uh, listening audiences on, on Fox News, um, he's gone to Hungary a number of times and has broadcast his show from there. Um, he did a video for one of the CPAC conferences that I mentioned. Um, he has consistently talked about um, Hungary, for example, as, as a model uh, for the United States, but we're also seeing that um, this promotion of American nationalism from the far right and, and using, you know, uh, countries in, in, um, in Central Europe as, as a model, that some of the, like, vitriol that we're seeing against, for example, the LGBTQ community um, is something that um, has, has really emerged in a very virulent way in the last year, but we know that this is also happening in countries like, like Hungary in particular and, and Poland as well and other places. And it's, seen, it's, it's in the framework of um, this idea of, of like a nationalism and creating like this, you know, a, a country of uh, traditional roles and um, traditional cultures. And uh, that means... Um, you know, that a community like the LGBTQ community or progressive, that, that, that they're not included in that. And so I think we're seeing this across the board in that different um, countries are learning from each other about this, um, this, this mainstreaming of, of, um, of, of, of hatred towards groups that they don't want to accept into their society. So I'll, I'll stop there, but there's, there's also, um, I guess, one, one more thing to add. Is, is that um, when I mentioned um, the, the conference in Hungary, another thing that happened in, in Hungary is that a group of young conservatives, and they were from two different groups, um, Young Republicans, which is a very long-established group in the country, and Republicans for National Renewal, which is a new group, invited all these um, uh, you know, na nationalist parties, like ultra-nationalist parties, to this event called, uh, it was an event about Western renewal. Um, and I think it's really important to say that it was all these youth parties from different countries that met together. And, uh, and they, they made a statement, and the statement was you know, about tra traditional, that there should be traditional roles, that, um, you know, that, um, we, that, that countries should focus on, on nationalism. Um, and be you know, and, and that they shouldn't let in immigrate immigrants. Um, so this is something. So we're just seeing just seeing these common themes emerge um, from all these different um, you know far right populist parties and some and also ultra nationalist parties. And I want to point out that the photos up there uh, on the left, it's uh, these are senior government officials, um, who one from Slovakia, one from Poland, and so these are individuals who. Um, have uh, have had connections to the violent far right uh, in their respective countries, and uh, a few years later uh, became senior government officials uh, for their countries. Uh, Rafael, mm -hmm. well, there are two things I would like to highlight in addition to what the, uh, what the other speakers already mentioned. Uh, one is obviously the the, the impact that uh, right wing extremist ideas emanating from uh, countries such as Hungary or Poland may have on the diaspora communities uh, elsewhere 
that includes the US, that includes Canada, that includes the UK. And we know there is a lot of uh, um, evidence uh, showing this impact is actually real, especially in terms of anti-Semitic propaganda uh, that has an audience among, among uh, those communities. And our organization, Never Again, has looked at this issue for a number of years. And we have collected enough evidence to, um, um, well, that's enough for me to, to, to say we are worried about that. And another thing is, 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 is more general. Uh, well, certainly uh, countries such as Hungary or Poland could be seen as laboratories in many ways uh, for, the, for the international far right, uh, or at least points of reference. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, there is a lot of back and forth. Uh, there, there is there is uh, there is a lot of platforms for for, for cooperation between right wing extremists internationally, and it's not a secret. A lot of it is uh, um, is made possible through social media. Right. Uh, and for example, the Independence Day march in Warsaw still has a a fan page on Facebook, through which uh, a lot of the fundraising is conducted. Uh, for example, and we know Facebook is not a Polish company. <laughs> uh, uh, so I think that the, the whole issue of internationalization uh, has a very uh, important aspect, which is which is social media, and never again uh, works with initiatives such as uh, Get the Trolls Out, European Observatory uh, of Online Hate, uh, Global Alliance Against Digital Hate and Extremism, and I think this is a very important uh, aspect of um, of the problem there. Thank you. Um, so, as I said, we have t a little bit of uh, time for questions. Uh, if uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. And uh, why don't we just before the the, uh, the panelists answer, can we just have we have two questions? Uh, can you ask them, and then once the two are, you know, you'll respond to them uh, at the same time, please, ma'am. Uh, 
anyone who wants to respond, um, please keep your remarks to about 30 seconds. Yeah, each. very quick, maybe so I'll respond to your, your point as well, because uh, mostly. Um, I think it's been mentioned that the migration crisis has been, uh, and the anti-Muslimity, if you like, of that uh, event in Central Eastern Europe was mentioned as a, as a turbocharger, super spreader of that ideology in the region. I agree with you. We don't talk enough about the particular uh, group that you spoke about and that you come from. From what I look at in Ukraine, interestingly, the anti-Muslim aspect of the far right there has currently died down. And all the groups that are fighting on the front line, they're actually, they, they feature Muslim fighters to show off that it's a whole world is with us. But it's no mystery that those far right groups actually for, were forged in the fire of actually fighting with Muslim stu students in, in cities like Kharkiv in Eastern Ukraine. So it is there, it's muted at the moment, but it will come back especially in my case, if I look at Ukraine and the Ukrainian groups, after the war hopefully ends, it will stage a return. But not this, the, the particular case that you're talking about, but generally the kind of like, you know, cosmic struggle, Christians versus Muslims, it is, it animates them absolutely. The only funny thing, inverted commas, is that there, is, there aren't just enough Muslims there in the region. You know, that, that's the thing. Rafael? Yeah, just adding, adding to this, uh, there is a phrase that uh, we have had uh, for many years, we have heard it many times, it was coined by Paul Lendvai, I believe, antisemitism without Jews, meaning the Jewish community is very small, but the level of antisemitism can actually be very high. Uh, that applies to Poland and, and, and other countries in the region. And I think since 2015, we can definitely uh, expand it and we can talk about Islamophobia without Muslims. So the Muslim community in Poland has a long history, but it is very small today. Uh, but the level of Islamophobia is, is actually very high. Uh, uh, so I, I completely agree with you also in the sense that uh, I think that you know, the, the, the legacy of, 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 the, of the wars in former Yugoslavia and, uh, and the genocide, as well as the denial of the genocide, that is a very important uh, well, point of reference to what is happening in, in Central and Eastern Europe today, we must not forget. And also, uh, in, in answer to, to, to your question, which I think is, is, is actually very important, yes, there are also uh, uh, good things about international cooperation, and, uh, and uh, my, my own organization, Never Again, uh, has been very active in international networks. I mentioned some of them. I uh, could also mention international network against cyber hate, and I could not emphasize more this importance of the social media platforms, uh, what they do and what they don't do in response to, to, to extremism uh, globally, but in, in the region of Central and Eastern Europe uh, in particular. If I, I could, oh. I, I was gonna say, if I could throw out an additional question uh, for Marilyn and Katarzyna, uh, one of the deliverables from the Eradicate Hate Summit, it's, you know, it's what type of, type of action can we take from these discussions, and for me, it's important that we have more collaboration, cooperation between practitioners, researchers, journalists uh, from North America uh, with you know, all of Europe and not just Western Europe. Uh, and, and so any suggestions in addition to responding to the questions uh, the audience members asked uh, in terms of how we can collaborate uh, more closely with you and or you know, Americans with uh, Poles and Slovaks and others. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just say that um, I'm happy to say that Rafal and I are actually part of an international working group that's been working together for 20 years in uh, sharing information um, and to develop strategies against extremism. So uh, we just celebrated our 20th uh, anniversary of being together in, in Ottawa. Um, so I think it's, it's incredibly important uh, to have international cooperation on these issues because, um, you know, if... Uh, and, and the way to do it, um, I think that organizations that promote democracy and democratic values have to, um, you know, and, and we, I don't think we thought we, we would need this in this country, but we absolutely do right now. And I think that, that we need to be working with other groups that are promoting democratic values. And, and that's super important. And I just wanted to add one thing to the question that you asked. Uh, you know, you've heard a lot this week about Buffalo and the Great Replacement. Well, the Great Replacement theory, you know, was most recently promoted by Renaud Camus, a French writer who was talking about Muslim immigration to Europe. And, you know, we, 
uh, I know that you know we we talk about the Great Replacement. We we especially after Buffalo, we were asked to talk about it. What does it mean? How is it impacting um, politics in the United States, for example? And I agree that anti-Muslim sentiment is not talked about enough, but that is part of it, and we always talk about that being part of it. And um, obviously, more needs to be done. And I'll, I want to give you an opportunity to, if you. Um. um Mm. By all means, we, l l another 30 seconds is totally yeah. fine. Okay, so how we can cooperate. So. Um, um, I think one of the parts, like for example, we spoke about it yesterday, that Polish cities should be in some kind of networks. Yeah. Um, um, we, ha we have at least one foundation and one good organization who is focused on uh, hate speech. Those organizations would be should be highly supported and should be in some kind of um, um, bigger, bigger networking. Um, I hope that uh, politicians, especially opposition politicians, will understand that they have to be more engaged, and because they have really lots of public. Uh, money that they can use in it. I suppose, I hope that next year they're going to be here, at least yeah. one of them, uh, to learn and build some contacts that they can use in the future. Because, uh, and this is what I'm going to like try to inspire, like you need to search for sources, for practice, uh, practical resolutions, um, resolves, I don't know, you need to like understand that this is one of the most important Think for us now, Casper. Five for, seconds for policymakers. We've talked about Russia, Ukraine, United States, and the EU Schengen zone area. Ban these guys from coming to us, or make us ban them. <laughs> Simply take away their passports, take away their assets, and it will change the game for them. Believe me, it's still a reward. It's still a cherished asset. Kill it, or help us kill it. I want to thank all of our panelists, and I want to thank you, the audience. Um, and uh, if you have any questions for them, by all means, um, say hello after uh, we conclude this panel. Thank you so much.